I appreciate everyone's presence again this evening. I'll invite you to turn to the first chapter of the book of John uh, tonight. We began our study in the opening passage of John's gospel uh, this morning. As I said this morning, I, I looked at it and I thought, wow, that's way too much to cover in one Sunday morning session. And so I've tried to split it up between Sunday morning and then tonight's Sunday night. Appreciate the songs Jeremy led because if you noticed, they all had to do with light. And uh, we're going to talk about Jesus as the light tonight. Uh, the, we organize this opening passage of the book of John, sometimes called the prologue, in, in this way. So that we can divide it up into four parts, and uh, the parts are related to each other. And so uh, the first part, verses 1 through 3 or 1 through 4, something like that, uh, describe Jesus as the Word and discuss Jesus as the Word. We talked about that this morning. The second part discusses Jesus as the light, verses 4 through 8. And then he reverses that order in the last half of, of uh, this particular passage. This time he discusses Jesus as the light first, and then he comes back to the idea of Jesus as the Word. And so what we did this morning is we just looked at the first part and the last part, the bookends we might say, and we discussed Jesus as, as the Word. And we talked about what that might mean. Talked about the meaning of the Word itself, the word Word itself, and how it's understood and how it was used in the ancient world. And how that might relate to what John is trying to say in this passage. And then we notice some of the characteristics that John associates with the Word in, in these verses. And so, Jesus as the Word is equal with God in nature. The Word was God. He is equal with God in rank. The Word was with God. He is equal with God in eternity. In the beginning was the Word. And he is equal with God in power. By Him or through Him, everything was made. He's very emphatic about that. There has not been anything made without Him that has been made. And so the Word, the Word eventually becomes flesh. We understand this is the Son of God, and, or Jesus. Uh, he is equal with God in power and performs the work of God in creation. What other being is able to create out of nothing? Sometimes we talk about uh, a work of art as creation, creating a work of art. Well, you, you've got a canvas, you've got paint, you've got brushes. You're not creating out of nothing. A person might create a piece of music, but it's got instruments that he's working on. And, but God and His Son, and the Holy Spirit is involved in this as well, create the universe out of nothing. And so that's the power of God. And so the Word is equal with God in power. The Word is equal with God in the qualities He possesses. And so in Him was life. And we talked about that as being a quality that God possesses. He has life in Himself. And the Word also has life in Himself. And He's able to impart life to others. Not just physical life or the animation of a physical body, but eternal life. And so He has eternal life to give. And so those are qualities of the Word. Then the Word becomes flesh and dwells among us, and we beheld His glory, also an attribute of God. He is full of grace and full of truth. And we talked about how those are true of Christ, that He's full of grace. He lives according to grace, and He's able to extend grace. John uses the expression grace upon grace. As if in waves of grace, one wave of grace after another, after another in our life. And then he's also full of truth. The conclusion then is that Jesus is the Son of God. We're going to talk about the middle part of this passage in this, uh, tonight, in this session. And talk about Jesus as the light. And so let's go back and talk about Jesus as the light. And so that's introduced to us in verse 4. In Him, that is in the Word, was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend, some versions may say overcome, some versions may say grasp. That's a, a word, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. There came a man sent from God, his name was John, who came as a witness to testify about the light. So that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, 
And the world did not know Him. He came to His own, and those who were His own did not receive Him. But as many as received Him, to them He gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe on His name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but, but of God. And so, talk about Jesus, the Word, as the light. What does John mean when he says here in the very first part of this passage, In Him was the life, and the life was the light of men. Well, in the Bible, light, and used in a figurative way or symbolic way, stands for everything that is good and upright and holy. And so in the Gospel of John and in the Epistles of John, we find the word light used in that way, well, fairly often. To stand for, to convey the idea of everything that is right and good and holy and righteous, those kinds of ideas. And so in 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, we find that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. And so God is light, He is good, He is holy, He's righteous, and in Him the opposite is not found. And so what is unholy and not good is not found in God. And then we read in the Gospel of John that Jesus is the light. And so God is light, in Him dwells no darkness at all. And so Jesus also is the light. And so we would expect that. If the Word, the Son of God, is in union with the Father, if He's with the Father, in union with Him, we would expect to find the same qualities in Him that we find in the Father. And so it's really not a surprise when you think of it in that way to hear Jesus say, I am the light, I'm the light of the world, John chapter 8 and verse 12. And then in the episode with the blind man in John chapter 9, again, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Of course, Special significance in that story is you're bringing a man out of darkness. He's a blind man, and so he's brought out of darkness and enabled to see to the light, so to speak. Everything that's evil, satanic, uh, ignorance and sin, those kinds of ideas are rep represented by darkness. And so look at Ephesians chapter 6. We're encouraged here to put on the whole armor of God. So that we might be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness. Against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And so darkness is, is uh, symbolic of wickedness and evil and ignorance and everything that is satanic in, in this world. Good people are drawn to the light. And so God is light and Him is no darkness at all. Jesus is the light of the world. And good people then are drawn to the light. Look at John chapter 3. John chapter 3 beginning in verse 19. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world. And so Jesus, the Word became flesh. Well, the light, if Jesus also is the light, Jesus has come into the world. The light has come into the world. And men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds are evil. And so there are a lot of people who shun the light. They try to stay out of the light. Their deeds are evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light, does not come to the light for fear that his deeds would be exposed. That's true even in a kind of a physical sense. If people want to do evil, they do it under the cover of night. And so, you know, they don't want to be seen. They're careful. They don't want to, you know, anybody to find them out. And so a lot of times evil is done in the night, but spiritually as well, that people love the darkness rather than light. Their deeds are evil. They don't want to come to the light of truth because it will expose their deeds as evil. But in verse 21, he says, he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. And so People that are trying to do what's right, trying to be good, trying to be godly people, they're attracted to the light. They want to come to the light. Well, look at a couple of other passages with me about some of these things. Ephesians chapter 4 is another passage. This isn't by John, this is by Paul, but the figures of speech are similar. These are sort of universal figures of speech. Light represents goodness. Darkness is associated with evil. And so we find the same kind of language in Paul's writings. Verse 17. So this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, 
being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. And so just look at the what's associated with, with the darkness. There's, there's ignorance, the hardness of heart. People are callous and sensual in nature and impure and greedy and all of that associated then with the dark. And so good people are attracted to the light. They want to come to the light. But those who are evil are trying to conceal their behavior and seal their practices under the cover of darkness. John tells us that if a, a man hates his brother, you know, the brother that's hating another brother, he's still in the dark, he's still in the dark, still in the darkness, still overcome with evil. And so Jesus wants to bring people out of the darkness. He wants to bring them out of ignorance, out of evil and into the light, into goodness and where there is knowledge and understanding and um, out of evil associated with all that satanic into the light where they can have fellowship with God. And so if we walk in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from our sins. We'll go back to the book of John. Let's look at a couple of passages. John chapter 12, verse 33. He was saying this to indicate what kind of death he was to die, being lifted up. And so he's indicating by that expression that he would be crucified. The crowd then answered him, We've heard out of, uh, out of the law that the Christ is to remain forever. How can you say the man, the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? So Jesus said to them, For a little while longer the light is among you. Walk while you have the light, so that darkness will not overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he goes. While you have the light, believe in the light, so that you may become sons of light. And so... I'm, I'm here, I'm the light of the world, walk with the light so that you can be sons of light. Then verse 46, I've come as the light into the world so that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness. And so I've come to bring people out of the light. So Peter uses this expression, he's, calls us, he's called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And so out of ignorance, out of sin, out of evil into knowledge, into understanding, into goodness, and into fellowship, into fellowship with God. Could we say then, when John, when John says, in him was life, we talked about that this morning, he has life in himself, he has life to give, especially eternal life, I've come that they may have life and have it abundantly, so in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And so the illumination of men, spiritually enlightening men, bringing them to, the, to goodness and into fellowship with God. Can we say then that Jesus is the light of the world who has come to give life to men? And Jesus is the life, Colossians 3 verse 4, there's life in Jesus, who has come to rescue men from darkness and bring them to the light. And so he's the light who's bringing men out of darkness into life. He's the life bringing men out of death and into knowledge and understanding and fellowship with God. So we could summarize all of that by saying He has come, the Word, the Son of God has come into the world to bring life and light to a dark and dying world. Can we say it that way? That He has come to bring life and light into a dark and dying world. Well, John continues in, first, in the Gospel of John, the first chapter. Uh, there came a man, verse 6, sent from God, whose name was John. He was not the true light coming into the world. Uh, there was the true light. Well, he was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. And there was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. So he talks about the testimony of John the Baptist and his role in the life of Jesus. Matthew tells us that the people considered John to be a prophet. His testimony would be of great value. It would carry a lot of weight with the people. What did John have to say about this? John, uh, John, John was considered to be a prophet. What did he have to say about the true identity of Jesus of Nazareth? Even in John's account, John the Baptist had a great deal of influence with the people. John was such an outstanding figure 
that they thought he might be the Christ. <laughs> Are you the Christ? No. No, I'm not the Christ. Are you Elijah? You remember Malachi? The last book of the Old Testament ends with this promise that Elijah would come. Are you Elijah? No, no, not, not Elijah. Are you the prophet? Remember Deuteronomy chapter 18? God tells Moses and the people that he would raise up a prophet like Moses and the people should listen to him. Are you, are you that prophet? No, no, I'm not, not, not that prophet. And so you can see even in those questions that they have a very high opinion of of John the Baptist. And so what he says about Jesus of Nazareth would be very important, very influential. Well, John's description uh, of uh, John the Baptist continues. He was sent from God. John chapter 1 verse 6, there came a man sent from God. Sometimes I read things that people seem to have the idea that John the Baptist was disturbed by the spiritual lethargy and the, the immorality. And so he decided we need a spiritual revival. We need a spiritual awakening. And so, he, no, well, it, wasn't John, it wasn't by John's initiative that he did these things. He was sent from God to do them. And so comes a man, there came a man sent from God. He prepares the way for Christ. Verse 22. What do you say about yourself? They asked him. I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. As Isaiah the prophet said. I am the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. The one who is not the Lord. But came to prepare the way for the Lord. And so I've come to get the people ready for Christ. In verse 33, part of that preparation involved baptizing people. And so in verse 33, he says, The one who sent me to baptize in water said to me. And so again, John's mission is God-given. <laughs> and so he didn't take it on himself. It's God-given. The one who sent me to baptize. Uh, have you ever wondered that? You know, you don't read about people being baptized in the Old Testament. But then all of a sudden in the New Testament, you find John the Baptist baptizing people. Where did he get that idea? Well, other people may have baptized, but you know, John says, God sent me to baptize. That, that's why I'm baptizing. The one who sent me to, to baptize said, said these things. John is so influential, he even has his own disciples, at least for a while. In chapter 3 and verse 25, we find a mention of some of John's disciples. And so all of that is simply to say that John the Baptist's testimony about Jesus is going to be greatly important. The people thought... He could be the Christ. Maybe he's Elijah, one of the prophets. John says, here's a man sent from God to do the work of God. What, is, what does John say about Jesus? Well, he says in chapter 1 and verse 30 that Jesus occupies a higher rank than he. This is he on behalf of whom I said, after me comes a man who is higher rank than I. He existed before me. How, how could that be? Remember John the Baptist, a little bit older than Jesus, was born before Jesus. And yet John says he existed before me. Well, if in the beginning was the Word, okay, we understand. Yes, okay, I see. John understands that Christ existed in heaven with the Father before he, he came to earth. And so that's part of his testimony. He occupies a higher rank than I because he was before me. He baptizes in the Holy Spirit, verse 33. Uh, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. He is the Son of God, verse 34. I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. And so, if John the Baptist's testimony is important, what does he testify? This is the Son of God. What do we mean when we say that Jesus is the Son of God? Well, you know, the Muslims, they, they uh, object to that statement and that, that idea. They think that if you say someone is the Son of God, that implies that, Jesus, that, that God has a female partner... And that they produce a son. No, no, that's not what we mean at all. What we mean is that the son of God, to be a son of someone, is to share the same character and share the same nature. So we're saying the same thing when we say Jesus is the son of God that John says when he says, and the word was God. In John chapter 5 and verse 17, Jesus says to the Jews, my father works until now and I work. Or maybe to rearrange the words a little bit, we can say that Jesus said, My father and I are working until now. 
And they objected to that because when he said that God was his father, he suggested that he is the son of God and made himself equal with God. And so to say that Jesus is the son of God implies that we believe Jesus is equal with God. That, that was John's testimony. In John chapter 3 and verse 30, John concluded that it was proper for Jesus to increase and for him to decrease. After all, Jesus is of a higher rank. He existed before John. He baptizes in the Holy Spirit. He's the Son of God. And he says, he is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And so, just as in the Old Testament, lambs were sacrificed to take sin away. So, Jesus takes away the sin of the world. And so, the light came, comes into the world. Now, John, John testified. Now, John's not the light. But he testifies concerning the light. And this, this is his testimony. And it carries great weight. Well, John also in this passage tells us that there are a couple of responses to Jesus the light. As he comes into the world, people respond to the light in a couple of different ways. Well, we kind of suggested what those ways are already. One is that the powers of darkness or the darkness... Attempts to overcome the light. And I think that's the idea here in verse 5. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not grasp it or seize it. In the sense that it did not overtake it or overcome it. And so the darkness in the world is very powerful. But it's not powerful enough to extinguish the light. And so the darkness or the powers of darkness that are trying to snuff out the life of Jesus. And of course, they do that in lots of ways. Ultimately, the powers of darkness try to snuff out the light of Christ by putting Him to death. And of course, that failed. But the powers of darkness have enough influence in the world to keep some people from coming to Christ. And so in verse 10, it says, He was in the world and the world was made through Him, but the world didn't know Him. And so He comes as the light of the world. The darkness trying to overcome it. Can't do it, but it's effective enough to blind the eyes of some. The world did not know him. And he came to his own. And those who were his own did not receive him. And so, there, that's one response to the light. Some people reject the light. Some even try to snuff out the light or extinguish the light. And so there are plenty of people in Jesus' day who are trying to do that. The Pharisees and chief priests and others. Of course, they, they fail, but they give it their best effort. <laughs> People through the years have been trying to extinguish the light of Christ. And they haven't given up today. Some will even come as defenders of Jesus. Or we talked about that a little bit this morning. How some try to deny that Jesus is the Son of God. They were really just a man. Or they're trying to extinguish the light. <laughs> even though they're coming in the name of Jesus in some, in some way. That's what they're claiming. And yet, they're unable to do it. They may have some success in turning some people away from the light, but they will never extinguish it. Uh, I read a comment about, uh, from John Lennon. You remember John Lennon was one of the Beatles. Uh, somehow, I came across this comment of his over the last week. He said, uh, Christianity will go. It will vanish and shrink. I need not argue about that. I'm right and I will be proved right. We're more popular than Jesus now. I don't know which will go first, rock and roll or Christianity. Jesus was all right, but his disciples were thick and ordinary. It's them twisting it that ruins it for me. Now, Christianity, it's on the way out, Mr. Lennon says. Christianity is on the way out. Now, uh, but... Um, and he said, there's just not even any argument about that. Well, I got to thinking about that. I came up with some, here's some information just pulled from the internet about the Bible. Now, the Beatles sold about 1.6 billion records. That's a lot. That's a lot of records. 1.6 billion. That's, that's quite a bit. But contrast that with some of these figures. 100 million copies of the Bible are sold every year. 100 million every year. Between, estimates are, between 1815 and 1975, 2.5 billion copies of the Bible were printed. 
So if 100 million copies of the Bible are sold every year since 1975, that's 40 years, 4 billion Bibles have been sold in the world. That's about the time the Beatles broke up, about 1975. Since that time, 4 billion, billion with a B, Bibles have been sold in the world. The Bible has been translated in 349 languages. More than 2,000 languages have at least one book of the Bible translated into it. 20 million Bibles are sold in the United States every year. 20 million in the... You know, if the, if the New York Times included the Bible on its bestseller list, it would be number one every year. You know, they don't, they don't include it though. Gideon's International, you know, the, the group that puts the Bibles in the motels... Gideon's International distributed 59,460,000 Bibles last year. 100 Bibles per minute over the course of last year. Well, 1.6 billion records, that's a lot. But you know, sales of Beatles records are going to decline. Fewer and fewer. And, uh, but the sale of the Bible just, just keeps on going. There'll come a time when people will say, John who? <laughs> oh yeah, he was that rock and roll guy, wasn't he? Yeah. But uh, the light will continue to shine. So one reaction to the light is to reject it and to remain in darkness. But there's another re response to the light. And that is to come to it. Verse 12, but as many as received him. And so these are coming to the light. As many as received Him, to them He gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in His name. To receive Him then is to mean, means to believe in His name. And these are born, not of blood. We talked about that idea of being born again last Sunday or the Sunday before that. Those who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And so some come to the light. They believe that Jesus is the Word of God, the Son of God. And that if they do that, come to the light, receive Him, believe that He is the Son of God, gives them the right to become children of God. And in doing this, they escape ignorance and evil and darkness and come to everything that is good and holy in fellowship with God. We have accounts of people in the book of John who do that. They come to the light. Those include Andrew, in chapter 1, spends time with Jesus, he's coming to the light. He goes and gets Peter, he brings him, he brings him to the light. Nathaniel, in chapter, uh, later in chapter 1, comes to the light. The woman at the well, the blind man. The blind man is coming to the light, isn't he? And you know what, I, I, think that's, I think that's the point in Nicodemus' story. Sometimes people will say, why did Nicodemus come to Jesus by night? <laughs> Boy, he's in the darkness. But he's coming to the light. He's coming out of the darkness into the light. We read about Nicodemus three times in the Gospel of John there in John chapter 3 when he comes to Jesus by night. In John chapter 7, there's some discussion about what to do with Jesus. And Nicodemus says, Our law does not judge a man unless it first hears from him and knows what he's doing. And so we have to listen to what he says and we have to think about what he does. And so Nicodemus is that kind of man. He, he listens to what Jesus says and he, he thinks about what he does. And then the last time we read about Nicodemus in chapter 19, he's coming, he's coming for the body of Jesus. He's coming out of the darkness, isn't he? He's coming out of the darkness into the light. And so he comes with Joseph of Arimathea to get the body of Jesus so that he might help bury him. And so in, in the Gospel of John, we find people coming to the light. Now to those who receive Him or believe on Him, God gives the right, the authority, the power, the ability, the capability to become children of God. Now they're not already children of God, but once you receive the light, receive, believe on Jesus, then you have the capability of becoming a, a child of God. And so let's not stop at believing, let's not stop at receiving Jesus but let's become true disciples of Jesus by obeying Him and following Him and putting into practice the things that He taught. The Romans became disciples of Jesus because they obeyed from the heart that form of teaching to which they had been committed. 
And so when we do that, we can be made free from sin. So we believe on Jesus. He's the word of God. He is the light of the world. We accept that. We receive that. And we commit ourselves to following him, to being truly a disciple. Well, that, that then just brings us to this question. You know, what, what, what will you do with, with the light? <laughs> what, what are you going to do with the light? Are, are you going to remain in darkness Remain in ignorance and evil. Or will you come out of the darkness and come to the light where there is forgiveness and goodness and fellowship with God? And then begin your walk in the light as he is in the light. Well, we hope that you'll do that. Why not come tonight believing that he's the son of God, confessing your faith, repenting of your sins, being baptized in Jesus' name. Begin that walk in the light. If you've been in the light, if you come to the light, but you see, oh wow, I've slipped back into the darkness, come, come out, come out of the darkness to the light. Repenting of your sin, asking God to forgive. We can help you some way tonight. We invite you to come as we stand and sing together.